Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the SGM Association's draft recommendations for handling image integrity issues. My name is Katrina Fennell, I'm Director of Journal Services at Elsevier, I'm hosting the session today. Just to give you a quick introduction to the SGM Association, it supports over 140 publisher members in advancing research and um, helping members work together to develop standards and technology to ensure research is high quality, trustworthy and easy to access. Members include academic and professional publishers, but also learned societies and university presses and cover all scholarly disciplines. We're delighted today to introduce the SGM Association Working Group on Image Alterations and Duplications, and the draft recommendations of the group is launching today. Most of you are probably familiar with the, the issue of image integrity, but for those who might not be, um, this is an, an issue that there has been awareness of for quite some decades, but perhaps even more attention in the last couple of years. Um, roughly about 10% of retractions, according to the Retraction Watch database, um, have some kind of image issue. Um, and I think perhaps particularly in recent years, there has been concern about also um, image issues sometimes being an indication of um, the presence of a paper mill product. Um, the big paper from 2016 estimated that about 4% of papers with Western blocks contain some kind of image duplication and that perhaps approximately half of those seem to be deliberate. We're very lucky today to be joined by a panel of experts who have decades of experience as editors and publishers. So I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Soumya uh, Smanathan, Athens, sorry, Soumya, from Springer Nature. Um, Bernd Pulver from Embo Press and Teodoro Pulverenti from ACS. Um, the working group in general is chaired by my colleague Eisbrun Jan Alpersberg from Elsevier, and including today's experts also includes uh, Sarah Robbie from Taylor and Francis, um, Jacob Kendall Taylor from, ja from JAMA, SJ McRae from Airy Systems, Tim Spencer from Rockefeller University Press. John Slynn from Wiley, and also Yaris Van Rossum from the SGM Association. So that's enough about who we are. It'd be great to know a little bit about the audience and your context. Um, so we're just going to ask you to help us with a very quick poll. Hopefully, you can see now. Is your main interest in this topic from the perspective of an editor, publisher, researcher, research integrity officer? or another role. And just to sec the wait for the poll results, which if that takes a while, we may, great. Okay, so we're seeing a large number of publishers attending and um, quite a few editors, which is great because I think we also, these guidelines very much have editors in mind, but also research integrity officers, researchers, um, and it'll be interesting to see also what the other, other interested parties and what perspective they're coming from. So um, we'd like to start telling you a bit about the group. Teo, would you mind just telling us a bit about the origins of this working group and why the group saw a need for these kinds of recommendations? Just to give Teo a second to unmute himself, I'm gonna. Thank you, I wasn't unable to unmute that. So yeah, thank you, Katrina. Uh, the SDM Standard Technology Committee, I appointed this working group to answer questions regarding uh, image aberrations or uh, alterations, certification and like, but also to identify tools that can assist um, journals in general for the detection of image alterations. As an output of this working group, um, and so the effort is an output of this effort and collaboration among uh, publisher, the working group um, has generated a list of recommendations for the handling of image integrity issues. And the recommended actions um, are based on the collective experience of all the members of, uh, of the working group and cover, um, I would say, a large number of image anomalies and also are in line with what is being recommended by, by COPE. In general, uh, as a group, we recognize a lack of 
a great uh, classification for, for such issues, but also um, a lack of consistent approach for the handling of, uh, of uh, image integrity issues. And this might have contributed to um, inconsistency among journals, but also uh, may um, undermine the editor confidence in assessing some of these integrity issues. And in general, um, the lack of agreed classifications or consistent approach um, might, you know, might represent um, an issue also when thinking about uh, software detection. So this the group started uh, with the, uh, purposely with the, with the generating the list of, uh, of recommendations to fill this, uh, this uh, 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 gap knowledge. Um, and you know, the, 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 the recommendations are based on principle of integrity for images and data and also on how editors should handle uh, such issues. So overall, uh, we hope that you know, with the recommendations, we lay an important foundation for, um, for uh, the approach to image integrity issues and also to further collaboration among publishers on this topic. And I guess Katrina is having the same problem I had in unmuting yourself. <laughs> yeah, apologies for that. Just a slight, uh, slight delay there. Um, so thanks so much, Teo. And just to give a quick, um, maybe some people who are super eager have already read the recommendations. Um, we had some some nice feedback from from some editors, but to give a sense of the overall um, content. Um, the recommendations try to give a structured approach to editors, both for pre-publication checks, but also for post-publication assessment of potential issues. Um, and that basically comprises of, of three parts. The first is sort of underlying principles to follow in these kinds of cases. The second is um, a three-tier classification for different types of image issues. And the third are recommendations for editors based on those three different um, tiers. So today we're taking the first step of introducing these recommendations to the community, but this is just the first step. Um, the next stage is a consultation period where we invite and really encourage the community to help us improve the draft recommendations. Um, and they will be available, um, are already available on OSF for comment until the 31st of October. Um, so we really encourage people to take a look and, and let us know if there are any areas of comment or, or expansion. Um, now, Samia, I mentioned the, the core principles um, that are outlined in the recommendations. Would you mind telling us a bit more about that? I feel like this is the revision with the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. The boat's on there. Struggling to unmute. unmute. So thanks, Great, Katrina. Yeah. So as we all know, researchers are ultimately responsible for the integrity of the data acquisition process, the data management, and for ensuring that the results, including the images, reflect the conditions of data collection. So we thought a good way of actually starting out the recommendations is to set out some basic principles and considerations that researchers should be aware of with respect to data acquisition, image processing, and the appropriate communication of results. And these are, you know, quite, quite simple, but important principles. For example, that images should reflect the conditions of data collection, that they are not processed so as to enhance or minimize certain effects that change the interpretation of the original data. Uh, we really stress the need for transparency about how images are generated, and the need to describe any acceptable alterations so that editors, peer reviewers, and readers can determine what was done and can also understand why it was done. Um, and I think, you know, it's really, really important for researchers to be aware of this and also for journals to perhaps think about incorporating these as part of standards for integrity for images so that everyone is aware of best practice around image collection and, and communication of results. So that was really the aim to sort of start out with these broad principles that apply to images and then build on that to, to develop principles around uh, actually how editors can, can respond to image concerns.
apologies for the delay. I'm going to leave myself off mute now to avoid delays, but just some warning that you may hear some children causing noise in the background, I'm afraid. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, that was very much looking at the principles from the perspective of researchers. And of course, the document also looks at core principles, principles recommended for editors. Um, Bernd, would you mind telling us a bit more about the principles from the editor's perspective? Sure, Katrina, I'd be happy to. Yeah, and indeed, as Sami already alluded and, and uh, the previous speakers, the document is very much centered also on giving guidance to journal editors on how to engage because we all find ourselves often struggling with uh, making consistent decisions on these many cases that we see. So, so some of the core principles that we've, that we've covered is, is really to say that, that journals, um, editors have a responsibility to support the reliability of the scholarly literature, which should really go without saying. But we did detail that basically their remit is limited to the claims and evidence provided within the research article and not in doing research investigations on their own on research misconduct, which is, which is really an institutional responsibility on some countries now a national responsibility. Um, importantly, journals do not mete out sanctions and retraction is not really intended as a punishment, but solely to correct the literature. So that's a really core principle. We note also that editors cannot be expected to detect all issues and conversely note that and rather emphatically note that not all anomalities that are detected imply intent to deceive. And this really brings us to this three layered um, classification that we're gonna to come to in a minute. Uh, we also um, refer to the COPE and CLUE guidance, which is very important, these, these two initiatives, which really lay out how editors should communicate and cooperate with authors on the one side and research institutions on the other side, but also go further and, and identify how um, journals should collaborate on some of these cross-journal uh, uh, issues that arise when, where uh, labs have, have um, modified multiple papers, um, which, which hasn't been covered before. And then finally, we, we do note um, that corrections and retraction notes should contain sufficient detail to follow the issues. That's been one of the core um, problems out there that, that they're generally too sparse. And uh, we do uh, mention that we can uh, include separate author and uh, journal statements, for example. We encourage posting of interim editorial notes, which can then, then be superseded by the actual correction or retraction note. And finally, uh, I would say that the editors um, can request source data, uh, being aware of the data deposition uh, policies out there, and discuss and uh, we discuss and consider how to allow the publication of replicate data that's often supplied to uh, to support conclusions that were made based on maybe faulty data. So that's the sort of the core principles for the editors. Thanks, Brian. That's great. Um, and one of the things you mentioned that I think I, I really think will be really welcome, and we had some feedback, some early feedback from editors, is guys interacting with with institutes um, and the recommendations around in general. How editors should interact with third parties. And Theo, I think you're going to tell us a little bit more about those recommendations. Yeah, so um, readers may raise uh, questions regarding uh, the data published in a, in a scientific article, and those concerns, of course, should be taken seriously by, by journals. And this is independently from uh, you know, the source of, of, uh, of, uh, of the concerns, if the comments are anonymous or not, or if the comments are on, on pre-publications or post-publications, because it, it might happen also at the pre-publication um, uh, level. And to refer to the, the clue uh, recommendations, this, uh, this allegation should be judged for, uh, on their merits and not be uh, dismissed. Uh, automatically. It's true also that the allegations have to be supported by solid, uh, concrete evidence of uh, image integrity issues, and then would have to be investigated appropriately. And in that sense, of course, after further scrutiny, the editors uh, may, may decide not to pursue uh, some non-definitive issues or minor issues that are not affecting the main conclusions of, uh, of a manuscript. As approach, uh, usually authors should be encouraged to, to, um, uh, to address compelling issues that are raised uh, regarding a, a manuscript. And then, of course, editors um, at their discussion may decide to respond uh, publicly to, to some of these concerns, as well as journals might respond, for example, on, on, on commenting platforms or, or social media. One thing that I would like to, to make clear is that uh, journals uh, do honor 
uh, the request for COVID in China when it comes to readers and whistleblowers that bring something to the attention of, of the journal. So this is definitely uh, unequivocally uh, we do honor uh, those requests. Um, so we talked a bit about some of the challenges that we were, we've were we heard about from editors and we hope, hope to try and address in the recommendations. But now we'd like to hear a bit from you about what you consider to be the biggest challenges. Um, and we think most of our audience today seems to be editors and publishers. So hopefully the poll is a little bit in the right direction. But if we have it totally wrong, you still have six weeks to uh, comment on the recommendations and uh, suggest other areas that maybe haven't been covered yet. Um, so just waiting one sec for the poll. Um, perfect timing. So what do you find to be the biggest challenge when handling image integrity issues? Um, is it uncertainty about whether duplication or alteration has occurred or uncertainty about whether that was accidental or deliberate, the time required to check images, perhaps pre-publication, raw data not being available, um, responsive enough of authors, um, the fact that institutional investigation may be pending, or are there other challenges that you, that you encounter? Just give one sec for the results. So. Otherwise, maybe we'll move on. I mean, people are putting a lot of thought. I know people, this is also asking people to pick one is probably a challenge in itself. No, it's great. We've got um, 92 participants out of um, out of the participants we've got, and they're just increasing. So I'm just about to launch it now. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, people are still fantastic. Okay, so that's that's in very interesting to see. So the so far the largest number has been uncertainty about whether that the problem was deliberate or um, or accidental, and that's actually some of the the early feedback we had that one editor said they they welcomed the guidelines for one reason that they felt that sometimes this could be somewhat subjective, and that they welcomed there being some. Um, shared guidance that it was not only up to them so that they could feel they were being fairer to authors as well, that there was something more, some more structured advice rather than them just making a subjective decision. And um, the time required is also, um, has also been raised as a, as a common challenge. Um, we know, for example, particularly um, papers with a lot of images that can be extremely time consuming to check if it has to be done manually, um, which in some cases it may still be. Um, and then after that, we have uncertainty of whether it is actually duplication or alteration. So some of these, thankfully, are areas where hopefully, as the technology keeps improving, um, technology can help us at least. So um, moving on to, um, we mentioned one of the key parts of the recommendations document are the classification level of, of um, image issues into three categories. Um, so I'm going to ask, uh, Samia to, add, to tell us a bit more about that. And she's magically the one which is great. Thanks, Katrina. It's actually really instructive to see the poll results and to see some of the concerns that this broad group of, of attendees are facing. And I hope that actually in the course of these, developing these recommendations, we're able to address some of these concerns, or at least provide a way forward for us as a community. Um, to arrive at some greater consistency. So I think, you know, I just want to start out by saying that every case is a little bit different, right? And the outcome is inevitably going to depend on weighing up a number of factors, including the type of image concerns, as well as the number of image concerns in a given paper. But what we want to do with developing this classification is set out a structured decision-making framework to support editors, and others, you know, including image screeners, who are grappling with image integrity concerns to help them make consistent decisions about the impact of these concerns and the integrity of the paper as a whole, and then on the basis of that to determine the appropriate editorial action. So we outlined three broad categories of image concerns that increase progressively in severity, and they can be categorized based on let's say three, um, three aspects. 
One, whether there's clear, unequivocal evidence of intent to manipulate with intent to mislead. That's one. Two is the impact of the image aberration on the conclusions and the figure, the main conclusions in the paper. So what is the impact of this uh, you know, image manipulation on the scientific findings? And then third and very, very importantly is the availability of source data, which we define in the context of these recommendations as minimally processed data underlying a figure. And I just really want to stress the importance of source data. Uh, a couple of the considerations in the in the poll were around, you know, the challenges in in determining whether something is inadvertent or or intentional. So, I don't I don't think we can ne ever completely you know determine that without actually being the party that has access to to lab notebooks and so on. But source data is actually really, really essential to help us determine whether whether the experiment was carried out as as uh, was presented in in the study. And lack of availability of source data can make resolving issues very challenging. So I think as part of these recommendations, you know, I think as a community, we also want to encourage better stewardship of original data for authors. Um, and so I can I can go into a little bit more detail into the the levels, uh, but I'm also happy to just move on and maybe come back to that, Katrina, depending on how we're doing for time. I think we're doing okay for time, and I think from the pre feedback we sort of received, this was areas that people were really interested in. But also the intentionality question, I think, is really interesting. Yeah. So so for example, I said um, the the the, the categorization actually involves three broad categories. So for example, a level one image integrity issue would lack what we consider unequivocal evidence of image manipulation, whereas a level two issue may involve falsification of the image presentation in ways that no longer represent the original data. And that can also have an impact on the claims that can be made. So. Actually, the, the table in the paper gives some very specific examples of what each of these image issues might, might be. So for example, for a level two issue, it may be that in fact, the, the manipulation is unintentional that may result from a lack of awareness of best practice, but if it nevertheless misleads the reader and has an impact on the scientific findings, then that absolutely must be factored into the overall editorial decision making in terms of appropriate, in terms of determining appropriate action. Level three is the most severe type of manipulation where it's really very clear that there is an intent to mislead. And in, this can include things like sort of collaging different experiments together, you know, a uh, high level of manipulation of the data, inverting, flipping images, and then going in and selectively enhancing or minimizing details in an image so as to uh, actually then um, have an impact on the, 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 the results that are presented in the figure. Um, and it, it's effectively fabricating data. So that's the sort of thinking that we brought into developing the, uh, the, the classification. Thanks so much. Um, so the next thing we wanted to have a discussion about is the, the connection between the classifications and then the different typical editor actions that might be recommended, might be recommended um, either pre-publication or post-publication. And Bernd is finally going to tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, sure, sure, Katrina. So, so I think it's indeed one of the key issues uh, that or the key values of this project is that we provide sort of two, two axes of classification. So one is what Samia outlined is the three levels. And then the second axis is, is really to differentiate between pre and post publication. While um, many of the issues, of course, underlying a given problem may be exactly the same before and after publication, how you approach it um, tactically, if you want, and how you resolve the issues is, of course, fundamentally very, very different. And we've done, for example, pre-publication screening now for, for a long time. And 
and you can resolve these level one issues very, very uh, efficiently before publication, when after publication, they would require a corrigendum and, and a very formalistic process. Um, so so we've, we've added to this table these, these two dimensions of before and after publication. And just to give you an example for level one, if the authors provide, we, we outline it, if the authors provide both compelling data and all the authors agree, on, on the data that has been provided, as well as a plausible explanation of what actually happened, what went wrong, we can just move along and publish the paper before publication. Um, if there's any trace of any issues that were discussed, they can be captured in uh, journals that have transparent peer review processes, but otherwise it will stay in, entirely invisible because there was no malintent and it was, we, we're talking about plain accidents. Um, while the same issue post-publication will, of course, require a much more for formal corrigendum, sometimes with replacement of the figure on inline cor uh, correction. And again, we give details of, of the level of, of correction that we recommend. So for level two, maybe one other example is um, the key conclusions may, may, may be affected and issues go well beyond uh, poor scholarly practice and may have some indication of an intent to mislead and at least that cannot be excluded. And here uh, we have a very detailed process of how we would, uh, how we recommend to notify the corresponding author first then the corresponding author's institution and uh, inviting cooperation by an investigation and, uh, and then move on as COPE also outlines to decide whether allow a revision or correction before publication or whether to reject or revoke publication. Uh, for, and then for level three, as Saumia said, uh, which are, again, we have to emphasize, unfortunately, extremely rare. And um, of course, be, before publication, typically also, also very hard to nail because intent is very, very hard to be sure about. Um, we, we outline details how to reject and retract with detailed information and institutional notification, but importantly, also contact um, other journals after the rejection that may inadvertently then publish the paper without realizing their problems. So that's one thing that's been missing from, from the uh, research integrity discussion between journals that, that uh, often people just move on to the next journal and, and, and get away with publishing exactly the same problems again. So, so that in a nutshell is some of the guidance that we give. Thanks so much, Bernd. Um, I think the one of the things that um, we see being asked about um, um, intentionality is a question that comes up, but maybe we'll we'll come back to the questions at the end because there was just one more topic um, that I wanted to ask Theo to address, which is um, that also maybe something that will come up in the next six weeks as people are commenting on the on the document that's on on OSF. Um, is the challenge of the, you know, the recommendations by their nature are general. And the STM Association, as we talked about, it represents publishers, very different types of journals, different subject areas, and that can pose some challenges. Um, and maybe Teo can tell us a bit more about, you know, the challenge of trying to keep these recommendations broad enough that they will hopefully be of use across the board. That's a great question. As a group, we um, we do recognize that different disciplines may have different practices and also needs, right? And um, the recommendation provided in these documents are more focused on, on life sciences. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Sonia, uh, Bern, and I are both uh, are all like we have a cell biology sort of uh, of uh, background in that sense, um, but. Um, you know, we, we recognize that the one size does not fit all. And so there is also a recognition that um, the, 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 state, the current state of technology might pose a limitation in terms of expanding this to, to other um, areas. Uh, we recognize that the level of the tools that have been developed for image analysis uh, are, you know, there are a step forward compared to other, um, to the analysis of other data types or data sets. Um, so there's still a substantial amount of work that needs to be done to expand this to, to, to other areas and, and, and other subtypes. Um, I wanted to add something to what uh, Bern also said about uh, pre-publication and different uh, peer review processes. Of course, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, single level anonymized or, or um, a transparent peer review independently from, from the peer review process uh, um, or models that's chosen. Reviewers can play an important role, at least at the pre-publication stage, 
we we as a as a group we, we're trying to 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 identify tools that might assist in in detection of geomagnetic alterations but it's also true that the expertise of scientists that look at this at these uh, manuscripts can be very helpful to to editors so editors should encourage reviewers uh, to to um, uh, bring up or identify any issues that might come up uh, we, in terms of questionable data or unethical research and share it so that, that we, the publication of such data can be prevented. Um, and one thing I wanted to add also, uh, based on all also what Bern said is, uh, you know, we, journal editors uh, should analyze, uh, submit the uh, data and, and figures with the help of their viewers, but the, this is all in good faith. There is no intention to police uh, the authors, but just, you know, there is no prejudice. It's just more about uh, making sure that what we publish is uh, solid and, and, uh, and reproducible. Thanks, Teo. Um, so, of course, we, we mentioned a couple of times that this, this draft, we really consider the first step. This is you know, still very much a living, a living document, um, and we really encourage people to comment. I'm just going to share, hopefully it's going to work okay, to share um, some of the details of um, where you can comment. Um, the document is, is on this link on OSF, and I believe Commenting feature is the top right hand of the of the screen. Um, you need to be you need to be registered and logged in. Um, um, just so that you can see that properly. Um, maybe Teo, you can tell me because you're not muted whether it's visible. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's visible. Great. Um, and then there will be a period where comments will be considered and 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 um, additions potentially incorporated with the goal of having the I want to say final, but of course nothing is ever final with with recommendations. The final for now, if that's the best way I can put it, um, around the beginning of December. But there will be, this will be a document that, of course, over time may need to be may added to, adjusted as perhaps even as we become aware of issues that we're not aware of today or different in different subject areas. I think we all know that there's been a lot of work on this area, particularly in the life sciences, and perhaps also a little bit because some of the very active people, um, active journals, but also active um, volunteers like Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Bick, um, come from that subject area. So maybe there's been more attention, but that may change over time. Um, so we really do um, welcome your, your comments and thoughts on the recommendations um, and perhaps particularly from editors, from people who are in, in practical terms would be really using these day to day and, and, and potentially see, you know, areas where we could expand or, or, or change the recommendations. Um, we also have, thankfully, some great questions from the audience today and um, our panel is very well. <laughs> equipped for answering them. So I'm going to just put um, a couple of the questions. Um, uh, one of them was around the question of whether these, whether the journals asking for um, raw data or the publication of, of data articles um, should improve this, this situation. I know some journals already asked, for example, for the unprocessed version of the images. Um, um, along with the, the actual images that will appear in the article, they look for sort of the raw version as well, um, but also perhaps um, underlying data. Um, would any of the panel, like, sorry, I should, uh, should not try to throw it to all of you at the same time. Uh, Bernd, since you're, would you like to um, um, address that one? You may have some experience, direct experience with it, of course, as well. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Karina. I, I can comment on that. So, so we have encouraged and, and not us exclusively, other journals are of course doing this too. We encourage the position of source data for uh, almost a decade now, and about at least half of our papers have that. And we find it incredibly helpful, especially pre-publication, when we find issues to go back to the source data. And um, because many, especially of these level one issues that Samia mentioned, are actually easily resolved when you see what was done wrong when you compare it back to the source data because often people have spliced together let's say the classical one is western blots that are spliced mm -hmm. together vertically um, and you can actually see from the source data these were done as a contiguous experiment and and just a few lanes were cut out versus 
uh, a splice that goes across completely different experiments that were done on different days, maybe different different years, which is of course entirely inappropriate. So, so it does often help with the lower cases. Having said that, of course, if there is intent to deceive, you can deceive also easily uh, with source data, <laughs> not as not as easily actually, because it's 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 much more uh, detailed and and granular if you want, but you can. And and we've had in fact cases where we request source data where it hadn't been provided when we find issues. And in some cases, people cannot come up with source data even before publication. That's a good indication as a problem. But in some cases, clearly, we also obtained manipulated source data in response to our request. And then you can see that there's discrepancies piece which, which inadvertently stripped through and you immediately can classify it as a higher level, maybe two or even three, because you, know, you have then an indication that there is intent to deceive the editor at, at that point. So it is incredibly helpful. I think probably we all recognize the phenomenon of um, contacting authors at a time where you would expect the raw images should still be available, you know, within a few years of publication and being told that they're not available because somebody moved or, or you know, the USB got destroyed or laptops got stolen or, you know, we've all heard various. Um, and some of these things can actually happen, of course, as well. But um, I think that that's a dilemma for, for editors in a case where they cannot, so it's both publication and they cannot, no matter what they do, get hold of the original data or images, either from the authors or the institutes. Um, so, Samya, would you have any thoughts on like what, what position that puts editors in when, when that scenario arises? Post-publication, I mean where you would expect that it's a reasonable time frame, the data should be available and yet you're being told it's not. Uh, I think, thanks Katrina, I think that's a very, very challenging situation that, that editors and authors find themselves in when, you know, it's not a legacy paper, let's say, where perhaps the expectations around data stewardship um, uh, you know, are set against, you know, institutional and, and cultural norms around data preservation as well, right? So I do think it immediately calls into question a number of issues around responsible data acquisition and data management, right? Uh, but again, I would say that it's very helpful to activate the framework and to approach this through the lens of the framework. So start by asking, asking what kind of issue is this? Is this a level one issue? In which case then are, are there replicate data that were done contemporane, contemporaneously? Is it a set of, does, it's a completely different discussion altogether. So, I think that to me is the value of the framework is that allows you to take a really kind of, you know, step-by-step -step approach through navigating multiple different kinds of scenarios. So I hope that answered the question somewhat. I don't, I don't think, you know, it's not, I don't think I would say yes, no, this is exactly the outcome to follow, but I would say use the framework and start by first identifying the kind of issue you have. I think that's really good advice, but also shows that there isn't necessarily a one size fits all for these scenarios, right? That every case, I, I don't know the, I can't unfortunately credit the, the, the name of the person because it was quoted to me secondhand, but apparently a former uh, research integrity officer at MIT used to say, if you've seen one research integrity case, you've seen one research integrity case. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges that we face. Um, um, one of the questions we had was about the, um, the sharing of information between publishers and Tay, I was hoping maybe you could um, address that for us um, as to um, sharing information about cases between, and we know there's some guidance from COPE on that and, and the, the, the clue guidance and the guidance for editor sharing information. Well, I, you know, it, it, is, it is definitely a delicate issue as also um, um, mentioned in COP guidelines because uh, there is some confidentiality issues in regards to, to authors, but there has to be also more cooperation among journals uh, in that sense. Uh, there, oftentimes a, a paper might be rejected uh, from, from one journal, one publisher, and, and um, 
uh, transfer or, or move to to another journal. But uh, as as editors, uh, it, it is important to to not to to um, you know communicate intent, but more of sharing information regarding potential uh, flow data or um, questionable data in a, in a manuscript. So. You know, this has to be done again. It's a delicate issue just because of of uh, um, uh, confidentiality, and it's not done with the purpose of uh, persecuting an author, but rather to prevent um, or correct uh, published uh, records in that sense. And, and uh, there is different groups currently discussing where to draw the line uh, in cooperation among among journals and where the institutions actually step in uh, in some of this uh, of this relationship because it, it is possible that an author uh, you know, m might have uh, some some uh, you know some uh, known issues uh, also uh, you know with, uh, you know with this, within the institution so it is about shareability and it is about cooperation among uh, among uh, publishers to prevent uh, publication or of, of, of uh, questionable data or correction or of uh, published um, records. Okay, thanks so much for that. Um, one of the other questions we had was about the role of reviewers, um, which I think is an interesting one. Um, uh, someone was saying it's already difficult as an editor. I know Lisa Elsevier, probably the most common dilemma that we hear from editors is trying to find reviewers and trying to find the right reviewers, more importantly. And that it's already a challenge that like, if we, do we expect reviewers to also start looking, looking, at, um, for, looking out for image issues? Um, and then we'll make it even more difficult to find reviewers. Um, I think that's a difficult one to answer for across the board. I, I would just say I, I would certainly ideally hope that journals would be able to detect these issues before the papers go to reviewers. And of course, anything reviewers, sort of that ethos, you know, if you say something, if you see something, say something, that certainly you would hope reviewers would be alert to this. But I think um, I would hope that we would be able to prevent you know, serious issue, papers with serious issues actually getting to reviewers in the first place. But maybe I'm being overly optimistic. Mr. <laughs> anyone else on the panel would like to comment? Well, I, I just a brief comment because this might arise from from uh, something I said in terms of of editors also collaborating with reviewers to to identify this pre-publication, uh, and I'll leave the word to 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 burn. I mean, of course. It's not solely relying on on reviewers. Uh, we, you know, from from the uh, editorial standpoint and publisher standpoint, we try to do our best to to identify these issues ahead of time. But it also, it's also true that that if reviewers do identify such issues, they, they should raise them to to editors. It's not it, the intention is not to put more work on 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 the reviewers and call it done, but it's more of a cooperation. Again, sorry, Bern. Thanks, fair. Yeah, no, no, that's a very good point, Theo. I, I, I think it, it is a collaboration between the editors and the journals, and there's clearly a scalability issue um, with manual checks. I think all of us on the panel have, have experience with manual checking, and if you do it properly, it does take an hour per, per paper. So, so it is very hard to, to make this scalable and thorough enough at the same time. So we definitely don't, at least we don't expect referees to do that level of screening. It's also a very, very different way to read the research paper than, than a referee would read it. So you almost have to reread it a second time. Um, but, but then to collaborate with the referee, of course, once an issue arises, either from the referee's own screening or, or our screening to discuss what the implications are to the conclusions, how fundamental they are to the research paper in question and so on, because it's very important in, 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 frame, in, in, in um, framing the, the response, of course, if it's a level one, level two or level three. So, so that collaboration that Theo mentioned is very important. I think the, um, uh, Katriona, the point you made about screening right at submission, of course, that, that is the holy grail. We have never managed to get to that point. We screen, uh, after peer review before we publish everything uh, quite thoroughly, but we cannot scale it to the 10 times more workload of doing it before. Um, and of course, I would push the buck up the road a little bit and say these things should be really screened also at institution level. And that's why we should collaborate also with these screening technologies and, and this framework also with the institutions to see how they can apply 
um, pre-submission screening processes, you know, because up, um, once it reaches the journals, really the damage has been done already to some extent, right? So, so I do think automation will help a lot, but I, I think we may, maybe we'll come to this in, in the discussion. I think automation has to be taken with a pinch of salt because as Xiaomi said at the beginning, every case is different and very, very finicky. Yeah, I think maybe automation is the term is maybe in this context and actually with a lot of a lot of um, apply um, application of technology within publishing is that it's unlikely this will ever be automated fully, right? Because the tool can, for example, tell you if there's duplication, but it can't tell you whether it's acceptable, it doesn't know the context, you know, for example. But this is a very good point. You mentioned that, like, of course, the earlier you check, the more volume you need to check, right? Which can be... And of course, papers could be rejected for other reasons anyway. So it may also be not worth the effort of, say, if it's taking an hour per paper. But one thing I think the group um, were conscious of is that um, sometimes when uh, people see issues post-publication, um, there are pe people who either have magic eyes, like I, I say, like people like Dr. Bick who have the magic eyes, or perhaps people are using um, technology that they find duplication between papers. Um, and I think that's something that we probably is not reasonable to expect that most editors or reviewers are even going to be able to do right that that's somewhere where maybe technology can do something that like is beyond the human capability almost right um, and that's somewhere where I think we see the opportunity and the need for publishers to cooperate maybe in a similar way that we've cooperated we cooperate now with text plagiarism and the um, similarity check uh, collaboration. Um, because there are things that no matter how great the reviewers or editors are, they just can't, can't detect. Um, so just moving on a bit to it, a question about different subject areas. This came a little bit, um, came up before. Um, are we seeing an increasing trend of image integrity issues reported across physical sciences apart from, from, um, by, from life sciences? Yeah, I think there's a trick. It's always tricky to say about trends when you maybe don't have base, baseline data but I certainly have seen, maybe as awareness grows, people start to become alert to these things. I certainly have seen cases in, for example, material science, um, certainly we've seen issues with in, in chemistry. Um, I don't know if there's enough data on this at this point really to say whether there's been an increase um, per se, um, but certainly, we have seen issues in, in fields outside of life sciences. I don't know if anyone else um, has any more data or experience with that so far. We have Can, as well, Katrina, but go I'd, I'd go back to your first point about actually not having a baseline. And I think as awareness increases, not only of the issues, awareness also increases of ways in which images can be massaged and can be altered. So we are, we have seen but I, I would say it's not yet at um, the levels that we see in the life sciences. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, well, well, I think that's exactly the point. The point I also want to make. The baseline point is very important. The more you look, the more you see. Um, and there's also the question of facilitating technologies. I well remember my very first image integrity issue was still on letter set when I when I joined Nature many many years ago. So so things happened also back then, but nobody looked. And, and we only found that case because it rubbed, the letter set rubbed off in the brown envelope that the paper was submitted in. So, so in essence, uh, things happened also way back and, and, and things are surfacing much more um, because the, the community is much more aware. Um, but I, I, Samia, the point you make about, about the sort of rat race that we're in now about the, the ease of manipulation is, is a really important one. And I'm actually personally quite nervous that as we're developing these screening technologies, the automation that you can turn this around and weaponize it and start to, to, to use it to go below the detection level of, of the screening processes, you know, journals apply, which is something we've already seen for, for text duplications, for example. So, so that's something we have to be acutely aware of when we're de developing these technologies. Katrina, is it okay to return to an earlier point in the, in the discussion? Of course, yeah, please uh, do. So, so Ben made the point about, you know, actually, yes, a lot of journals are investing in screening. It is challenging to scale and it's costly as well. And by the time you come to that, the damage is done and the need for institutions to take greater responsibility for the integrity of the work before, before it goes out to the world, you know, even as a preprint, right? 
Um, but but certainly once it enters kind of a formal peer review submission process. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think there's a lot to be said for interoperability of standards, right? Which I think to some degree we actually kind of have with something like plagiarism software. There's a very established plagiarism software that we're all familiar with, that we all use. It spits out a report. And then, of course, there's the human judgment that comes into bearing in terms of interpreting the report and taking action, right? We're totally missing that in terms of image integrity. But I think that this recommendation takes one step at least toward setting out some expectations for researchers, which, you know, a lot of the issues we also see may well stem from a lack of awareness and training around appropriate image acquisition, image processing, and representation. And that's something that the institutions have to play a role in. So, so actually, I feel, I feel there's a real opportunity for multiple stakeholders to collaborate and move us forward. Thanks a lot. That's a great point. Um, I had, we had an interesting question about, um, refers to interim editorial notes. So I'm not sure if it means, for example, expression of concern or similar, um, whether they should be in the form of a formally published notice or a more uh, informal unpublished um, flag that, for example, you can see on the web page, but is not a formal part of the publication record. I guess is the idea of like expression of concern as in principle temporary, which I think is a little bit tricky, right? Are they a formal part of the literature or are they temporary? Because if they're a formal part of the literature, then what do you do if the concern, for example, is if the editor becomes unconcerned, right? If the editor gets, you know, really good original data eventually and is no longer concerned. Do you consider they should be permanent, sort of formal permanent, or sorry, formal part of the literature or less formal? It's interesting. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that, actually, because we use both EndNotes as well as editors' mm -hmm. expression of concern. And the reason we have these multiple avenues is because we felt that these, that these cases are sufficiently complex that you need to have multiple tools at your disposal in order to be able to, do, to respond rapidly, but also responsibly. So EndNotes, we use EndNotes to when we are aware that there's an issue, it's being, you know, the discussions happening in the community, we're aware of it, but we haven't gotten far enough along to really be able to dig deep into the issues, right? But we want to quickly make the community aware that we're aware, we're taking action, there's a process that has unfolded. And that, that's not for, it is a formal update on the paper, so it's visible under the title of the paper. It's permanent, but it's not indexed. Um, and and editorial, you mean, for example, so it doesn't by, get by, a DOI. It's by Medline, it doesn't have a DOI. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Whereas, whereas, but it's it's discoverable, not through indexer sites, but through the paper itself. Oh, an editorial expression of concern unfolds after we are actually have done enough of a process to really be assured that there is a concern, right? Not, not just there's a discussion, but there is a concern that we can verify. And we have more insight into that. That is also permanent, it's indexed. It's, so it's discoverable on PubMed, it gets an independent DOI and it's bi-directionally linked to the original publication and to anything that follows. So nothing comes down. It's just a question of whether they're indexed, have DOIs. And that, that has worked very well for us, I have to say. EdNotes have really worked well in terms of rapid response. Um, so do you then ever have situations where it turns out everything's fine? And then what would you what would you do with those notes? The, the EdNotes get updated. So if we okay. resolve the situation and it ends up in a correction, then they get updated. They don't get taken down. They simply get updated with a note saying we've published a correction. Right. 
Okay, thanks very much. Bern, I know this is one of your... Yeah, no, no, this is great. Uh, some, you have a lot of experience with... No, 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 actually, this is a moving target. And, and it's a great example, I think, of standards emerging through these multi-publisher uh, pub, uh, and journal discussions, because, frankly, we do exactly the same as, as Springer Nature, and it's working extremely well. So one would hope that, again, this could crystallize into a standard, um, because you, you need to um, bridge this issue of, of the permanence of the scientific record and and the issue that something you know that a concern may may be right or wrong and and you have to self correct a concern that turns out not to be a fundamental flaw in the paper and and i think the solution Samia outlined uh, works rather well actually and and we have to uh, what we are still struggling with is to really make it scalable and do it much more often than we're doing at the moment but but it's definitely the way to go to to alert people there's so many pap papers with pending cases and they take so long to resolve i think the scientific community has been absolutely right to call on journals to to make to do more of these and that requires a more fluid approach than the traditional corrigendum type of very archaic way of doing doing the process which which has me meant that journals were very reluctant to post these because they're so final something that i i noticed came to my attention recently which i was sort of rather surprised by was that um in the last two years there have been more expression of concern published than in all time before before whatever it was, 2019, um, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I know from Elsevier's perspective, at least we partly contributed to that because we made a conscious decision two or three years ago, exactly as you were saying, to sort of um, have a more of an early alert system. Although we agree with what you both said is that the editor still needs to be concerned, if you know what I mean. The editor still has to have done some sort of assessment. It's not just that someone has flagged it, the editor has to have looked at the evidence and have sensed there, there is a reason for concern. But um, it seems others have also started to increase the, the, you know, the, the frequency of expression concern, which I think is really positive. And I think COPE, for example, I remember I've been suggesting this for quite some time, but it seems there has been a really dramatic um, increase uh, the last couple of years, which is positive, I think. And, so, and then Greece, comment on this one, just to see if we have different perspectives or if there's... I want to say that the increase, um, the increase might also be uh, related to the increase in cooperation between uh, editors or journals and institutions, in which cases some of the, the cases might take longer. So an expression of concern might be, uh, in that sense, up for longer, but also, uh, you know, telling the community that uh, we are, you know, we have identified something that is questionable about the, 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 the data and and we're still working on it, but in case, in case of involvement of institutions, they might take longer for, for obvious reasons. So the increase might the increase in expression of concerns might be proportional to also increased cooperation with the with the institutional investigations. Um, uh, uh, question that we had um, that was we were discussing earlier about the role of reviewers, and I just saw a sort of related follow on question, which was uh, is there to do with um, needing to have special expertise or access to very specialized software sometimes. If you're going to, if we're going to look at the, the source data, does that require special expertise? And they were suggesting, should we be thinking about recruiting special data reviewers, image reviewers, maybe in the same way that many journals have statistics reviewers, for example, at the moment? It's an interesting idea, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think just just a very quick comment because we're running out of time. Yes, that's a that's a great question, and and we think this has to be professionalized. Uh, it's it's very very hard again to make it scalable because the deeper you dig, the more the more to the core of the issues you can go. Um, we're looking at at a very superficial level at image integrity issues. We find most of them in certain types of data because they're more visible because they just jump out. Um, I think it, uh, Elizabeth Speak would say the same, um, but there's many, many, this is the tip of the iceberg, and the, the deeper you dig, in, I'm look, looking at real data, the, the more we can, we can do quality control. But again, this is something I think the institutions have to also step up, and, and we, I really hope, at least in the biosciences in the future, we'll have a much more established layer of data scientists that are professional data Science, scientists that are not in, the, in a postdoc track where, where it's really published or perish, you have to rush out your data, but, but they really take the time to do the statistics properly, to do the microscopy properly and so on, and, and are professionals in those um, expertises. So I, th I think it's too much to ask for journals to sort all of that out, essentially, but we do have a responsibility to do all we can, and we've hired one person to just focus on that issue for five of our journals. Focusing specifically on images, Bernd, is that what you mean? Yeah. 
I think you can see that emerging as well, that journalists are starting to feel the need to have their own image expertise specifically. So I want to thank very much thank um, our audience, everyone for giving us your time today and special thanks to our expert panel. Um, and I just want to uh, quickly mention again to encourage you to, um, the, uh, to comment on the document that you can find on, on OSF for um, the, the next uh, six weeks or so. And we very much welcome hearing areas where we could expand or improve the recommendations. Um, and hearing about your different perspectives, how, how you might find these useful or, or how you might find them um, improvements. Thank you very much, everyone. Wish you all a nice day, depending on where you are.